New research is changing everything we thought we knew about choline's impact on the cow and her calf, and top scientists have a lot to say about it. They are presenting new research that supports choline as a required nutrient to optimize milk production, choline as a required nutrient to support a healthy transition, choline as a required nutrient to improve calf health and growth, and choline as a required nutrient to increase colostrum quantity. This new research is solidifying choline's role as a required nutrient for essentially every cow, regardless of health status, milk production level, or body condition score. Learn more about the science that is changing the game and the choline source that is making it happen. Reassure Precision Release Choline from Balchem. Visit balchem.com slash scientists say to learn more. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series. My name is Scott Sorrell, Director of Global Marketing here at Balchem. Today, we welcome back Dr. Kevin Harvatine to discuss the dynamic world of feeding fat and where high oleic soybeans fit into the conversation. Dr. Kevin Harvatine is a professor of nutritional physiology at Penn State University. He grew up on a dairy farm in Pennsylvania and received his BS in animal science from Penn State. He earned his MS from Michigan State University and his PhD from Cornell University. His area of expertise is the effect of nutrition on milk synthesis. Currently, Dr. Harvatine investigates uh, fat, uh, milk fat depression, fat supplements, and the daily patterns of intake and milk synthesis. His lab conducts experiments ranging from the applied dairy nutrition to mechanistic molecular biology experiments. He also authored or co-authored over 115 peer-reviewed publications and has spoken extensively at regional and national and international conferences. Dr. Harvatine, welcome back to the Real Science uh, Lecture Series, and the floor is now yours. Great. Thank you, Scott. I, I really love listening to the and watching the, the podcast and Real Science Exchange webinars. So it's great to have the opportunity to, to be here and contribute to, to what, what you guys are, are doing. I'm also really excited to talk about high oleic soybeans. So it's really neat that we've had these high oleic soybeans for quite a while. So the first publications in dairy cows are actually 2017. So over seven years, we've been, been able to feed these to cows. But it's really the last two years that there's been an explosion of interest from dairy nutritionists in, in how to utilize these on farm. And it's by far the, the number one thing I've been getting questions on over the past, past year and a half or so. So, so I wanted to kind of step back and talk about uh, soybeans and soybeans feeding and the opportunities that high oleic soybeans bring to us. And I really see this as these high oleic soybeans provide opportunities. And it's a little bit different than, than say, you know, when we think about feeding choline and it's a nutrient and we have requirement, we're trying to meet that requirement with that nutrient. We don't have a requirement for high oleic soybeans in our diet, right? This is an ingredient that brings nutrients with it, but it we have other competing ingredients. And the reason we're going to use on, on a farm is going to be different from farm to farm. And it's going to be very much a different optimal. Uh, a situation based on that that individual situation. So I want to think of this as as an opportunity. So the what are the opportunities? The first is this lower risk for milk fat depression. And you know, I, if I go back to even before I started working with the, these high oleic soybeans, I usually don't make big statements or recommendations. But at the time, I remember saying to me it was a, a bit of a no brainer of feeding conventional versus high oleic soybeans. I could only see upside for these high oleic soybeans. And there was very much from the view of someone who's interested in milk fat depression, that it was very obvious from what we know about milk fat depression that these beans would be a lower risk for milk fat depression. And with that, it brings this ability to feed more what I call rumen available unsaturated fat. It can be a more economical source of dietary fat. I put a question mark there just because markets change and in, in different ingredients have different prices in different areas. So we need to look at that, that cost comparison, right? The other thing that I think is really interesting is to start thinking about our ability to have a homegrown dietary fat. So homegrown forages, and we think of 
growing energy and especially digestible fiber and contributing to protein in that diet. And that can really drive profitability when we can have homegrown feeds, right? And I think we haven't quite uh, thought so much about growing our own dietary fat. And since our fat prices have been up, that's a really neat opportunity that this brings to the dairy. The other thing is it's another an option for crop rotation. Um, we have a nitrogen fixing plant that can work into some rotations depending on situations. So it's all going to depend on the situation. And I'm going to call this key interactions to think through. So this is going to be available acreage if somebody's going to be growing these soybeans for themselves. If, there, if there's local sources of high lake soybeans and then competition from the soybean crushers and the premiums that are going to be paid there. So you're going to be competing with that. But then there's also going to be the extra additional interaction of what's the distance to the crush plant. So if your neighbor is growing these beans and in your long way from the plant, that trucking can start eating into its premium. So there may be some opportunity and that's gonna be very different for every farm, right? And then the last is cost of con competing protein and fat sources. So what I really wanna focus on today is some of the key nutritional questions and that's how much would we be feeding and also how to process those soybeans. So I want to start out first saying, what, what is oleic acid? So chemically, we'd call this cis 9 18 one So it's an 18-carbon fatty acid with one double bond in the cis 9 position. We could also call that in the omega-9 position. Uh, where we would traditionally think of this is in olive oil. So in the human diet, uh, olive oil is 55 to 80%, depending on which, which olive oil you're picking off the shelf. And olive oil is part of the Mediterranean diet. Mediterranean diet is currently thought of as being one of the healthiest diets for humans. Now, there's a lot of other things in that diet also, but olive oil and thus oleic acid have this uh, um, uh, kind of been associated with being healthier for humans based on being part of that, that diet. Or it should mention that oleic acid is not the only thing in olive oil. There's also a lot of polyphenols and other compounds that are there that may be contributing to that healthfulness of olive oil. It's about 20% of the fatty acids in normal corn and soybeans. In the body, it can be synthesized from stearic acid by sterile coenzyme the A desaturase, you might also call that delta-9 desaturase. This complicates it when we're studying oleic acid because when we see oleic acid in the milk, we are not sure if that oleic acid is coming directly from absorption of oleic acid or if it's steric acid that's been desaturated. So that desaturase enzyme is very active and probably about 65% of the steric acid is converted to oleic acid. The last thing is it has some unique properties that it actually is an emulsifier. So it can help form micelles. cells. There's key part of digestion, absorption of fatty acids. So these high lake soybeans have been selected to change fatty acid profile. And this is not anything new in the world of plant oils, right? So the one you're probably most familiar with is rapeseed and canola. So rapeseed has quite high concentration of 22-1. And this fatty acid has really negative effects for human health. So there's a group, there's uh, in, um, many years ago, an initiative in Canada to try to modify the fatty acid profile of rapeseed, and they selected it for low erucic acid, that 22-1, and they ended up with the oil that was 60% oleic acid um, and in about 9% ALA, that 18-3. ALA is um, more at risk for oxidation, so they wanted to make that lower, and they made a high oleic canola. So canola is actually stands for Canadian oil, right? But that's just a selected version of rapeseed oil. Sunflower and safflower similarly wanted to create high oleic varieties, so they took their oils from being seventy to ninety or seventy to seventy nine percent eighteen two to being seventy five to eighty percent oleic acid. In, in the case of canola, sunflower, safflower, they did this through traditional breeding techniques. So they found um, uh, varieties that were higher. They selected continually for this higher oleic acid and were able to do that. Why were they doing this? Well, the food industry is looking for better oxidative stability or what they call fry life 
And again, oleic acid is considered healthy. So they're looking to increase oleic acid, decrease omega, omega-6, right? So they were able to do that through normal selection. So what about the soybean side, right? We like to grow soybeans in the US and we were left out of this high oleic market for quite a while. So if we look at conventional soybeans, they're 54%. When they started using traditional breeding techniques, they ran into problems. There just wasn't natural variation there to select for a very high oleic acid. So they first took some GMO approaches. So there's Plenish and Vista of Gold or GM, traditional GMO uh, GMOs that have decreased that 18.2 and increased the laic acid to 70 to 80 percent. More recently, there's development of soy laic, which is, is a non-GMO, and it's actually a neat story. That uh, my understanding of this is that they they had two different strains that were slightly higher in oleic acid. And they figured out that when they bred those two together and made sort of considered a double mutant, they really dropped 18.2 and increased oleic acid. Um, there is one more that was developed by a company out of Minnesota that was a spinoff from University of Minnesota Research. And that used the CRISPR technique. So officially uh, that is also a non-GMO that was on, in the marketplace but it looks like they've they've left the market. So now we have uh, a number of different options in the world for making a hyaluronic soybean. So this hyaluronic soybean has two times or greater than two times the fry life of conventional soybeans. And the benefit is not only can we grow soybeans very well in the US, but also Americans love the taste of soybean oil. So this fits a lot better into the deep fryers at McDonald's and Burger King because it's an oil and a taste that we are, are used to. Uh, so the other reason to mention why this has really uh, been driven is that we've eliminated partially hydrogenated vegetable oil from our human foods, right? So when um, for many years, the, the oils that we're using fr used in frying and a lot of our uh, baked products that have long shelf life would have been partially hydrogenated vegetable oil. Trans fats are terrible for human health. Um, so those been eliminated in a high, these high oleic oils are a, a much better substitute. I did want to point out that, you know, oleic acid is not something entirely new for us in dairy nutrition. So I put at the bottom of the table, this calcium salts uh, of palm fatty acid distillate. So this would be our normal traditional Megalac and all of our calcium, normal calcium salt products. They're about 46% palmitic acid, but they're also 40% oleic acid, only 8% 18.2. If you look at tallow and lard, you would see similar levels of oleic acid, that those are all pretty much a balance of palmitic and oleic with much lower levels of 18.2. So the first question you have when you're looking to buy these soybeans is how do I know that my soybeans are actually high oleic, especially if I'm paying a premium for them, right? Well, most of this has been done by basically having source verified and segregated. So if you're buying the seed and growing it yourself, you, you know what you have. You just have to keep it in a separate bin. If you're buying it from a neighbor or a mill, they're going to have to be doing the extra work of segregating that. And our commodity system really isn't built so well for that, right? So that's a lot of additional work and uh, logistics to keep these things segregated within the supply chain. You could send off those soybeans for a full fatty acid profile by GC. That's going to be your, your call, call it the gold standard method. It's going to be very slow and quite expensive. But then you also have the option of NIR prediction. So this is able to distinguish conventional from high oleic. And I um, had a quick email with Ralph Ward that he has validated both lab and handheld NIRs being very good at being able to distinguish conventional from high oleic soybeans. I fully expected that based on the ability of NIR to predict fatty acid profile that um, NIR are, is known to work well for, for that application. And I'm um, guessing that we'll see more of that where you'll be able to verify if this is a high oleic soybean. So what's our, our current state of high oleic soybeans? Well, there's two commercial source, Plenished by Pioneer, and that is a GMO. And then the soy oleic that uh, 
is being marketed out of the Missouri Soybean Board, I believe holds the patent, and they are licensing this out to a number of different seed sales, uh, seed distribution companies, uh, and that is a, a non-GMO variety. Uh, the agronomics, similar yield, and there are a growing number of varieties for a while. That was a limitation that there is a limited number of varieties available, but that's been extended out quite a bit, at least from, from my, my uh, look at it. What is limited is stack traits for herbicide resistance, and they are trying to increase the availability of that. But um, within the regulatory framework, you have uh, approval of plenish, and you have approval of the herbicide traits. But the approval of plenish plus the herbicide trait requires a new approval not just in the US, but also in key export countries like the EU. So that that is slower to come, uh, but they are, are working on that. Um, I should also mention that there is an agreement with uh, Purdue Agribusiness that they are going to be growing the um, uh, Vista Bayer product under, under contract. So our current market, you know, variable and dynamic premiums that crush plants, they've gone up and down over the last couple of years. And again, very strong interest from dairy nutritionists. I think this is a really great example of having to think both um, short and long term. And so what are, what are some short term decisions around high lake soybeans? Well, there are dynamics in, in the high lake soybean and oil markets. And when they happen, they may present opportunities for dairy nutritionists to get a hold of these beans at, at maybe no premium uh, or at a good value, right? So what sort of happens in this is uh, these development of these markets is not exactly a linear occurrence, right? So if you think about uh, individual, individual dairy farms buying beans, that's not a lot of beans that is easy to grow that market slowly. But if you think about a crush plant switching over to crushing high oleic beans, that's a large amount that's needed all at once. So when these markets grow, they're going to go through periods where uh, a new player comes on to the market, takes up a lot of the supply, uh, and makes it really tight, and then the premium is likely to go up. But then in between some of those big players entering the market, the supply of those beans may actually be more than what um, some of the premium markets are, are needing at that time. And that's where, as dairy nutrition, we can kind of be opportunistic and go in and, and use that. So that would be short-term decisions as those markets um, uh, become higher or lower premiums. They can also be an alternative when our fat, fat markets spike um, or are not available. So we just had issues with Baltimore Port. That's where a lot of our uh, bypass fats come into the East Coast. If that pushes up the price on those, those fats, this would be an alternative just competing on, on price. And I think you can also think of long-term decisions where you're going to change crop rotations or your strategies to make that homegrown fat. You have better control costs and risks. Um, and we also have some of these long-term issues on oil, soybeans, and meal markets. So we have renewable fuel credit and demand, a lot of talk around aviation fuel and what that's going to do for these markets. Um, there's a predicted 23% increase in soybean crush in the next three years. That's going to really uh, change uh, what goes on in the market. Uh, what may happen, too, is not just the price of beans, but also the price of a soybean meal um, may go down and that's going to uh, really impact your least cost formulation. So this is where long-term you kind of need to look in your crystal ball and see what you think is gonna be the best opportunities. I just wanted to mention that if we look at our, our uh, fatty acid markets, fatty acids are an expensive nutrient, have been very expensive the last couple of years. The prices are coming down. But if we look at both soybean oil in our inedible greases, a lot of this is being uh, pressured by renewable biofuels. Uh, there's some questions of what may happen. So there's there's just a, uh, a lot of articles in the last couple of days where we may have be overbuilding our crush capacity. Um, we I, My crystal ball is always very cloudy, but uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with our um, uh, soybean oil and our oil uh, prices over the next couple of years, but it's likely that uh, fatty acids are going to 
remain an expensive nutrient for us. The other thing just to mention is that there is a, a, a bit of a balance when they are using soybeans for making oil that traditionally there's been about an equal amount of value between the meal and the oil during the pandemic. So from 2020 to 2023, the value of the oil went up drastically relative to the meal and that pulled up the value of soybeans. In the last year, that's moderated and come back to our no more normal balance between those. Uh, but I think you have to think about in the future, what's going to happen. I can't tell you what's going to happen, but that's a business decision um, that that you're going to have to take take a guess at. So I want to focus our discussion on full fat and expeller press soybeans because these are the products that are going to bring some fat into our diets. So just want you to quickly think about how are you using these ingredients? Well, if we look at what's in them, our beans are about 40% crude protein, expeller meal about the same bringing in a little bit NDF because we're bringing that haul along with it. We look at fatty acids, about 19% in our soybeans, five to eight in our expeller meal. These differ in their RUPs, right? And I'm not a protein guy, but I just put some round numbers in there. Um, so when I think of using these as ingredients, what I'm getting a little bit worried about is I hear a lot of people looking at these soybeans as just a fat ingredient, right? And they are bringing in fat and we need to value that fat, right? But they're also bringing in quite a bit of protein and a, quite a bit of RUP. So we also need to consider that when we're least cost formulating and thinking about the economics of this. So the if we think about the feed cost of income over feed costs, the opportunity to help on feed costs would be through both the protein and the fat that they are bringing in as an ingredient. Uh, one thing is that if you're going to start valuing these on those nutrients, you better have a good value for that, right? So I just pulled in the numbers for NASM on raw and roasted CNCPS, uh, raw and roasted Rock River and Fetopedia, and then Soileic has listed out the fat concentrations for, for their different varieties. And if you look, the, the ether extract values are all kind of um, in the same, same realm, 20, 21, 22, percent ether extract. Um, what concerns me is if you look at the fatty acid values in NASM, they have quite a bit different fatty acid value on the roasted beans than the raw beans. I don't think we should be losing fatty acids when we're roasting beans. Uh, they look to be overly discounting the conversion of ether extract to fatty acids versus what I would think it should, should be. So I don't want to tell you what book value to use for your soybeans, but I think you should be aware of this in your ration balancing program. Look to see what book values you're using for these and make sure uh, you are comfortable with that. So how variable are these? If we look at our standard deviation, standard deviation of 1.7, uh, 1.9 in the NASM, um, you know, that's on a thousand samples. Feedopedia, 1.3 on 160 samples. That's quite a bit more variation than I was expecting. Um, so if you start looking at what what is that variation from? Well, you know, with our, our roasted beans, if we're in quarters and halves, that can be pretty hard to subsample. And you can get separation in bins if you're sampling feed, feed coming out of bins. Um, so subsampling is one, lab analysis is, is another part of this, right? Uh, but what is actually the real variation? And um, just quickly look through some, some of the basic literature. And this is looking at a total of 37,000 samples, average of 1,400 samples per year from 86 to 2012. And you can see from year to year, there's a reasonable amount of variation. Overall, they're on this, this kind of slow linear increase in average fat concentration, but quite a bit of variation from year to year. And if you look at the biology of it, they know that the higher temperatures during seed filling increases oil concentration. And I've heard people mention that if you look at soybeans planted as full season, normal crop versus double crop soybeans are planted after wheat later in the year, that there is an expected difference in fat concentration, small but expected difference that those double crop soybeans they're filling that bean when there's cooler temperatures and they're going to have a slightly lower fat concentration.
So uh, I, I think, again, if you're valuing the fat in this, and this is part of your least cost formulation in comparison to your other fat sources, uh, you, you better know the fat concentration of your source and, and be really comfortable with, with that number. So the next part of this is what's the digestibility? So if we look at NASM, NASM assigned digestibility by ingredient, but they used, they combined all the oil seeds together and they assigned it a digestibility coefficient of 0.73 that's equal to the basal diet, basically saying that oil seeds really generally have good digestibility. Uh, there is the added potential that oleic acid could be increasing digestibility. Recent work from MSU shows an increase in fatty acid digestibility with albumasal infusion of, I think it's 50 grams of oleic acid per day. We've also observed that increasing oleic acid in fatty acid pearls increases digestibility again because oleic acid has properties as an emulsifier. Okay, so, so that... Um, Fat concentration, protein concentration, digestibility, that is sort of on the feed, feed value part, right? The other part of our income over feed cost calculation is going to be the milk production, right? So we need to think about fat and protein. Fat and protein are our main drivers of, of uh, cash flow for dairies. Um, over the last year, fat has been outpacing protein, but you know, looking long term, I, I think we need to think of both of those being, being our important drivers. We'll focus on milk fat today, but remember soybeans also have a big impact on your metabolizable protein and your amino acid absorption that has a large impact on milk protein yield, right? So I don't wanna forget about the protein side of this. We're not gonna talk about it, but if you're feeding these beans, you can't be feeding them just for fat and thinking about milk fat. You need to also be thinking about them as an integrated part of your protein um, uh, balancing, right? Okay, so milk fat has been on this linear increase. I know this is a messy graph, but this is average, 12-month uh, running average milk fat for all of our milk markets. And you can see since 2010, we're on a, a linear increase. In e Florida, in the gray line, has been increasing over the past year. So what does this mean? We have higher milk fat. That's great because that's what we're getting paid for. But nutritionally, we have to support this milk fat production, right? So milk fat is responsive to nutrition in, in both directions. We can decrease milk fat by causing milk fat depression. Key things there is unsaturated fat, but especially 18.2, diet fermentability, acidosis in our feeding strategies. We can also have a small effect by additional substrate. So acetate that we get from forage fermentation and also dietary fat. So fat level of the diet, but especially palmitic acid will have an impact there. So what does the cow need to make milk fat? If we look at that milk fat, 55% of those fatty acids by our textbook definitions, our averages, 55% of that we expect to be taken up from the blood is what we call preformed fatty acids. And we expect that 85% of those preformed fatty acids come directly from absorption. That's our what I call our 1960s textbook cow. That might not be exactly what the cow is doing today, but that, that's really our, our best understanding. So is there a requirement for fatty acids to support milk fat? We, we can't really say there is, but let's do some quick back of the envelope math. If we have a cow making that, that seven pounds of fat plus protein, right? That's four pounds of fat. If that's 55% preformed fat, that's 2.2 pounds of fat the mammary gland took up out of the blood. 2.2 pounds, and if we divide that by transfer efficiency of fatty acids from the diet to the mammary gland of 55%, and that's a really good number based on our abomasal infusion studies, that's four pounds of dietary fat that we should be providing the cow. Four pounds divided by 55 pound dry matter intake, 7.3% of dietary fat. Don't, don't try this, right? We cannot feed that much dietary fat. Uh, our fat digestibility goes down with higher feeding rates. Uh, regardless of what fat you're feeding, you're probably going to have troubles in, in the rumen, right? So so don't, don't feed that much fat. But I think that gives you an idea of, of the metabolic um, spot that cow is in, right? 
So we can't feed that much fat, but we need to be feeding some fat to try to support this cow's um, milk fat production, right? Uh, if we, so are we shorting the cow on, on dietary fat? A neat look at this is looking at dietary fatty, it's a tra dietary transfer of 18 carbon fatty acids to milk. So 18 carbon fatty acids cannot be made in the mammary gland, they come out of the blood. Uh, so this is a meta-analysis looking at the transfer. So what percent of the consumed 18 carbon fatty acids ended up in milk by dietary 18 carbon fatty acid level? And you can see a lot of these experiments are over 100%. And these are cows that are post-peak, uh, so they're not losing weight. Uh, so it's interesting that it looks like we think that some of these fatty acids are being made probably in adipose tissue and being sent to the mammary gland. Um, but but let's, let's even just look at it this moderate levels. According to CVAS, their average TMR that they get in is 2.3%. So even at 2.3%, we have a very high transfer of preformed fatty acids. So I think that's an indication that, that we are probably shorting that cow a bit on dietary fat. And I think over the last 10, 15 years, we've been decreasing dietary fat because we've been worried about this risk for, of milk fat depression, right? But at the same time, we need to be providing fat to support milk fat production. So uh, a complication is, it, it, so we, it, we start feeding dietary fat to try to support milk fat pr production. And when we, the complication is, is that as we do that, the mammary gland will use that preformed fatty acids to incorporate in milk fat, but it gets what I call lazy in that instead of maintaining normal de novo fatty acid synthesis, it will decrease de novo fatty acids and basically replace that de novo synthesized fatty acids fatty acid with the preformed fatty acid. And when it does that, you basically you're not getting an increase in milk fat, or maybe you're not getting a very big increase in milk fat. So let's look at an, an illustration of this. What I've plotted out is what what happens when we change dietary fat concentration. So let's go from a very high fat diet and we start decreasing dietary fat quite often we won't see a decrease in, in total milk fat. And why is that? Well, as we're decreasing preformed fatty acids, the cow will make up for that in de novo synthesized fatty acids. If we go back to how is that cow able to, to make all this milk fat when we're not feeding a 7% fat diet, well, she's likely doing it through an additional de novo synthesis, right? But we're putting pressure on that, demanding that that cow makes more de novo synthesized fatty acids. But what happens if the cow runs out of the capacity to make de novo fatty acids? Uh, this could be that she just runs out of acetate. She simply doesn't have the carbon to make these fat, fatty acids. It could be that she runs out of enzymatic capacity that the factory just can't work any, any faster, right? So when we hit that maximal de novo fatty acid, now as we decrease dietary fat, we lose milk fat, right? So that's not a good situation. We're not getting optimal, optimal production. So it's really difficult when we say, how much dietary fat should we be targeting? We, we really don't, don't know, right? Um, fat is expensive. Theoretically, we don't want to feed any more fat than we need to. So we would like to rely on the cow doing as much de novo synthesis as she can, but she can't do it all by de novo synthesis. So if you think about that whole herd, there's cows that are going to be different ends of the spectrum that that very high producing cow, you're asking a lot more of her than that low producing cow. So there's probably situations where herds and individual cows are being limited in, in the amount of fat, milk fat they're producing because they're not getting enough preformed, preformed fatty acids. Okay, so how do I think about supplying those dietary fatty acids? I like to start thinking from the bottom of the diet. So the basal ingredients, they're low in fat. So your corn silage and your corn grain, you know, they're, they're only 2% fat, but it's the majority of the diet. It's a lot of grams of fat coming into the diet. Okay. You have that, you need to account for that and know what you have there. 
Then I like to feed what I call rumen available and economical fat, and that's where soybeans fit in. And you're, you kind of like to max that out, and then you start feeding your rumen inert or dry fat supplements to get you to whichever final level of dietary fat you want to be. Don't really look at exactly where my lines are on this axis. This is just a theoretical theoretical graph, right? So how much avail rumen available on saturated fat can we feed? Well, it depends. It depends on the fat. So the fattiest profile, 18.2 is worse than 18.1 and 18.3, and they're worse than our saturated fat. But it also has an impact, of, uh, there's also an impact of the rate of release of the fatty acids in the rumen. And then we also have to think about the rumen environment, and that changes the microbes and their capacity for biohydrogenation. So things like fermentability, rumen pH, many other factors change that microbial population and will limit the amount of unsaturated fat that we can feed. And then the last one, which you should not overlook, is your risk aversion for milk fat depression. So if you're willing to go out on the plank and say, okay, I'm going to push this further and I may get milk fat depression, but I'm going to monitor. And when I do get milk fat depression, I'm going to fix it. And, and we're all going to be okay with that. You, you will take more risk. If you go in and saying, I absolutely can never get milk fat depression. I'm very risk adverse. You're, you're going to have a lower number, right? So this is going to be different for every nutritionist. can be different for every, every farm. So this diet-induced milk fat depression, we, we all know very well for, for the last 25 years, really, of, of um, uh, talking about this. So we have our normal biohydrogenation pathway, linoleic acid going through trans-11 intermediates. We alter microbial population. We get trans-10 intermediates, specifically trans-10 CLA isomers that cause milk fat depression. So that is 18.2 is the substrate for those bioactive fatty acids. What about oleic acid? Well, oleic acid is biohydrogenated, and it is biohydrogenated to trans 11 18 ones and trans 10 18 ones. Uh, but those actually, to the best of our knowledge, are not bioactive. So that 18 one is not a substrate to make those bioactive fatty acids. So how do unsaturated fatty acids contribute to milk fat depression? They all modify microbial population. Um, but they're not all so they all substrate for biohydrogenation also, but that 18.2 is in that pathway to make the intermediate. So 18.1 kind of gets a free pass there. It is changing microbial population, but it is not an, uh, uh, going to form those bioactives. So what's important? Amount of 18.1, 18.2, and 18.3, and also rate of availability in the rumen. So the slower it's released, the more the microbes can deal with it. So let's look first at, at what do we know about 18.2 versus 18.1. And this is what scares me a little bit because I get the sense from some nutritionists that they think 18.1 gets a total free pass on causing milk fat depression, that it's inert. It, it's not. It's safer than 18.2, but it's not inert in, in the rumen. Okay, so really nice work out of Lou Armitano's lab. He has corn. This diet had 1.8% total fatty acids, pretty low fat diet. He used isolated corn starch, to, makes a very low fat diet. And then he adds 1.7% of an 18.2 oil. And if we look at milk fat, he gets milk fat depression. He adds oleic acid, high oleic acid. This is lower milk fat than the control, right? Not as low as the 18.2. Uh, it's palm oil is doesn't cause a problem. Calcium salts of palm fatty acid distillate is equal to the oleic acid, right? If we look at the trans 10, 18, 1, we are increasing with 18, 2. We are increasing, but not as much with the oleic acid also, right? So it's showing rumen activity. Armitano also has a meta regression where they looked at how, how could they predict milk fat. So if you look at the uh, coefficients on diet 18.1 was negative 34, diet 18.2 was negative 75. So this is where we like to say that 18.1 is probably half as much of the worry of 18.2. And I'll actually commonly say 18.2 is probably two to three times as much of an issue as 18.1. Okay, so 18.1 safer. It's not inert but it is, it is safer.
Okay. Uh, so you also have a lot of experience with 18.1 from our calcium salts, palm fatty acids that can cause milk fat depression. Just some of our own data where calcium salts cause milk fat depression. I'm going to skip ahead because I want to talk about this, this grind size. Also, really nice work out of Wisconsin looking at uh, whole versus roasted beans versus the oil. And they got milk fat depression when they fed the free oil, but not the roasted beans. They went on to do grind size. So this is holes and halves, halves and quarters, quarters and less, and then grind, ground. And what they found is that um, as they looked at milk fat, grinding more did not have a change in milk fat in this experiment, but people are worried about finding these in the manure. But if you look at total tract crude protein digestibility, uh, it was okay as long as we were at this halves and quarters. If you look at soybeans past and feces, people get worried when they see that. Look at percent dry matter, it was only three to two to one percent in the ground. If you look at percent of intake, you're looking at four percent of intake when you're at quarters and less. 8% of the soybean intake when you're quarters and halves. We did something similar with whole cottonseed, and what we see is 1% of whole cottonseed past manure in primiparous cows, 4% in multiparous cows. So I just want you to, to, to have that in mind that e even though you see it in the manure, you have to think about this quantitatively, right? And if you look at back here, this is 18% roasted soybeans in the diet, and you're only uh, getting 3% of the manure um, dry matter. So, so they're being depleted quite considerably, right? Another example of grinding. Uh, so this is out of Ohio State. They're looking at whole cracked and ground. Uh, milk fat went down as they ground those beans more. They looked at nitrogen digestibility in the small intestine in total tract, also fatty acid digestibility. And their conclusion was for digestibility, cracked was okay, that there's no reason to go to grinding. So my worry with grinding is that you're going to make those more available in the rumen. Again, even though it's oleic acid and safer, it's not totally inert. So what data is there on feeding high oleic soybeans in expeller meal? The first experiment in the literature out of uh, Alex Ristoff's lab looked at conventional expeller, high oleic expeller, and high oleic roasted. And they saw a significant increase, 0.2 units in milk fat, uh, numerical increase in milk fat yield. Um, look, the two experiments out of Wisconsin, 2018, compared conventional versus high lake soybeans at an equal fat basis in primiparous and multiparous cows. And they did not see significant increases um, in this. But if we look at the multiparous cows, you have a numerical increase in both fat percent and fat yield. Uh, they did a second experiment where they looked at ground conventional and high oleic versus roasted conventional and high oleic. And what they found is no difference when they were uh, whole, sorry, whole roasted or sorry, whole raw, there's no difference. But when they ground those beans, the high oleics had higher milk fat than um, the conventional soybeans. So this shows that high risk of grinding conventional beans versus lower risk of those ground high oleics. We did an experiment where we fed five and 10% of conventional and high oleic soybeans. And what we found is that we increased um, uh, high oleic, we increased milk fat percent and yield with the high oleic soybeans. And we also increased milk fat percent and yield when we went from five to 10% both in the conventional and the high oleic soybeans. So I think this is an example of an experiment where we're shorting these cows on fat. And when we added additional fat coming from the soybeans, we got a milk fat response. We followed up when we did 0, 5, 10, and 15% roasted high oleic soybeans substituted for soybean meal. So we're increasing dietary fat in this situation. Um, we started at 4% milk fat and numerically increased up to 4.16% overall. If we look at primiparous and multiparous cows, they're both numerically increasing, but it's not significant. Uh, when we look at milk fat yield, this is in kilograms, but we have right on the edge of a tendency for a linear increase in the overall data. Primiparous cows 
Um, we're not changing, but the multiparous cows, we have a tendency for a linear increase. But here you can say, what's going on? Well, we're starting at pretty good milk fat, right? So these cows were able to make up for that low fat diet by de novo fatty acid synthesis. So there wasn't a lot of opportunity to increase milk fat, uh, but we're certainly moving in the right direction. Um, and if we look at dietary fatty acid, or sorry, milk fatty acids, we see what we expect that we, as we increase dietary fat, we decrease de novos, increase preformed fatty acids. Look at that trans tender intermediate up to 15% roasted soybeans. We're not changing trans ten, so we're not at all modifying our risk for milk fat depression at this level of soybean. What we did see is that after 5% roasted soybeans in the diet, we started hurting NDF digestibility. So went from 42 to uh, below 35%. And uh, you know the, the meta-analysis by Armentano a couple years ago said that uh, unsaturated fatty acids overall don't affect fiber digestibility until you go to high levels. And that's not what we saw here. And we also have a cottonseed experiment where we went from zero to 10% cottonseed, and this is in both primiparous and multiparous cows. And we saw a linear decrease in NDF digestibility when we did that. So I, I just am a, getting a little bit, have a question of what is the impact of these um, unsaturated fatty acids on fiber digestibility outside of milk fat depression. So I had previously thought as long as we were, weren't getting milk fat depression, we probably weren't impacting fiber digestibility. I don't want this to be uh, uh, alarming, but I think it's something that we should be thinking about and keeping an eye on our fiber digestibility as we're feeding more uh, unsaturated fat. There's also uh, an experiment that we did that compared conventional versus high lake and uh, expeller meal. And we did this in a low risk diet and a diet with moderate risk for milk fat depression. And we didn't see any effect on um, milk fat percent or yield in, in this, this experiment. So overall, what do high lake soybeans get you? Um, well, Lou Armitano and myself did a review of the data in I think it was 2022. And at that time, there's not enough data to do a true meta-analysis, but overall, uh, the average was 65 grams per day of increased milk fat in the experiments that were published um, uh, and available at that 5% feeding rate. This agrees with Lou's uh, meta regression that says for every 1% of dietary 18.2, you switch for 18.1 would be 44 gram per day increase in milk fat. Um, so, so it, it that that makes sense the ability to reduce milk fat depression. There's a recent economic analysis in JDS that looked at income over feed costs and over uh, uh, a number of years based on milk um, uh, milk fat value, right? So, in this plot, it's looking at the distribution of that income over feed cost over time based on if you think you're going to get 40 gram per day increase in milk fat in blue or if you think you're gonna get 50 gram per day increase in milk fat in the orange. Uh, so it's positive in all scenarios, but it's averaging out to that you know, 15 to 20 cents per cow per, per day. And that's after accounting for a 50 cent premium on the high oleic soybeans. The other thing to mention is oleic acid may also have an impact on physiology after it absorbed. So really great data coming out of the MSU vet school, Andreas Contreras' lab. They looked at abomasal infusion of 50 grams per day of oleic acid for the first 14 days of lactation. They see decreased plasma NEFA and molecular changes that um, demonstrate changes in adipose tissue lipolysis and uh, some changes in insulin signaling. So uh, certainly more work needed in that area, but oleic acid, if it's absorbed as oleic acid, uh, may have an, an effect there. So other common questions, should I still feed a dry fat supplement? Well, I think our best data there would be Adam Locke did two experiments where he looked at uh, low fat basal diet versus 10% cottonseed interactions with palmitic acid supplements. And he saw responses even when feeding 10% cottonseed in the diet. Um, I, I would expect that you're probably gonna see less of a response to those fat supplements as you increase dietary fat, 
uh, but that would be good data to inform there. Uh, how much oleic acid escapes the rumen? Probably not much based on the small increase in milk 18.2 we see with conventional soybeans. Biohydrogenation of 18.1 is probably slightly less, uh, but we don't have a number for that. What's the recommended feeding rate? Well, it depends on your goal. Uh, you have to be careful to least cost based both on fatty acid and your protein and amino acid balancing. And then lastly, can I feed them raw? Certainly, uh, uh, trypsin inhibitors are likely broken down to the rumen, so uh, that's not so much of a worry. Careful because there's urease activity, so don't have raw beans in a feed mix with urea. And then lastly, don't store them long because there's lipases that can cause uh, fatty acid rancidity. So in summary, high lake soybeans are a great opportunity for many dairies. Homegrown fatty acids, reduced risk of rumen available, unsaturated fatty acids allows us to use more of that in our diet. Um, rumen escape oleic acid may increase digestibility of other fatty acids, uh, moderate to high feeding rate, depending on your approach. Uh, some people want to maximize the amount of fat they're getting from them, and they're going up to 15 plus percent. Uh, other people are, are using it as an RUP source and getting the fat along along with it, right? So it just depends on um, that and the opportunities relative to your other ingredients. So need to, to thank the, the folks in the lab that, that do the hard work and need to recognize that we've had funding both from the Pennsylvania Soybean Board and um, the United Soybean Board for our work with High Lake Soybeans. Thank you and happy to take, take questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Harvatine. Before we get started answering those questions, we'd like to share a brief video and then we'll be right back to answer the questions submitted during today's presentation. Five cents might not seem like much, but when it's five cents for every cow every day, then it really adds up. New AminoSure XM Precision Release Methionine provides the optimal combination of cost, feed stability, rumen stability, and intestinal release to deliver the best cost per unit of available methionine on the market today. Learn how at balchemanh.com slash findyourx. All right, as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the Q&A tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Harvatine, your first question uh, is from uh, Dr. Jim. Do you know if roasting recommendations, time and temperature for uh, high oleic soybeans are any different than conventional beans? Yeah, so we, we do not have any different recommendations for high oleics. Um, and, and that's something that probably should be, should be looked at. Um, you know, there, there could be a little bit of a potential difference in, in how they, they heat. Um, but right now, I think we're, we're following our, our standard recommendations. Um, what I would say would probably be the most important thing is to make sure you're getting consistent roasting uh, in that you have good quality control there. So I, I think the quality control and consistency impact you can have is going to be much, much more important than uh, what probably is a very, very minor difference between between roasting temps. All right. Thank you. And Peter wants to know if uh, what about just using uh, straight high oleic soybean oil? Yeah. So there's actually a recent experiment in JDS communication out of Purdue, Jackie Borman's lab, that uh, that fed high oleic um, soybean oil. And as I remember their data, they did not have a significant difference in milk fat, but it was it was a numerical difference in, in the right direction. Um, to me, I, I mean, if you had a opportunity where you got a really, really good deal on it, uh, you could titrate it in and use some of it. It's not something I would go out and seek. I really like the idea of, of um, feeding in the bean because uh, that slows the availability in, in the rumen. 
All right. Dr. Delfino is uh, asking, uh, would rolled slash roasted beans be considered similar to broken halves or quartered beans? Uh, yeah. And so I was reading a bunch of these papers actually last night, and it's a little bit frustrating because the descriptions are hard to interpret because uh how they're some of them are processing and then what they're giving some aren't characterizing particle size all that that well um i i think it's going to be quite different um i'm not a processing expert but depending on if that bean is warm when you go and roll it versus if it's not in the impact that has on shattering i would be looking at your end resulting particle size um to to make that that determination all right Hassan appreciates your uh presentation uh and he believes that you've uh, published a paper um which shows that trans 10 alone cannot decrease milk fat compared to trans 10 cis 12. can you uh enlighten give uh, explain that just a bit yeah, so it's, so it's actually a paper out of um, uh, Dale Bauman's lab. Um, Adam Locke's actually lead lead author on that, that albumacely infused trans 10 18 one and did not see a decrease in, in milk fat. Um, now, they had a limited amount of trans 10 available, so they, they couldn't go to crazy, crazy levels. Uh, but if trans 10 was bioactive, I think we would have seen in, in that experiment. Um, I, I, I'm fairly comfortable that trans 10 18 one is, is not a bioactive fatty acid for milk fat depression. And in the right, the, the bioactive is that trans 10 cis 12 CLA. And that, that's really a key part of what makes this hyaluric safer. I think of it as they're both modifying rumen microbial population. And they probably differ in how much they modify the microbial population. We don't really have data on that. Um, but but we know that 18.2 is the only one being used to make that, that bioactive intermediate. All right. By the way, Kevin, uh, Dr. Hutchins giving your presentation uh, two thumbs up. So <laughs> uh, nice job. Uh, Dr. Park is asking, uh, what are your recommendations for transition cows with this strategy? Yeah, so um, it's trans a very interesting question on transition cows, and there would not be be much data actually. Rick Rick Grummer has a old experiment in um, late '80s, uh, but I think our transition cows are probably reasonably different from from back then. Um, you know, Adam Locke has has really nice data that feeding both palmitic acid and a calcium salt. Um, increases milk production during early lactation. Um, I think there's good justification to providing uh, a reasonable amount of fat in the diet. Now, you know, we traditionally think she's mobilizing all this fat. Why would we want to provide her more fat? Um, but it's certainly energy intake. Um, and I think that fat coming from the, the gut is different than fat coming out of adipose tissue. They're kind of on different different paths. So I'm a little bit hesitant to make a recommendation without experimental data to, to go off of it. But um, if you think about ability to provide some dietary fat, this is a good way to do it with lower risk of rumen disruption. All right. Vib has a, an interesting question. Um, what is the contribution of hyaluronic beans uh, to the record high milk fat percent observed in uh, federal orders across the country? Yeah, so I, um, great question. And and I, I've had uh, two trips to New York uh, since January. And I, I hear these stories about herds that, you know, didn't lose any milk production and they're at 4.5 and 4.7% milk fat. Um, it, 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 it's pretty, pretty crazy. So we've been on uh, this general linear increase, which I think quite a bit's driven by genetics. Now we're keeping up to that cow. We're, we're not, uh, the genetic potential is driving her capacity and, and we're meeting that capacity nutritionally, right? So I want to give us some, some credit there. Um, 
this recent increase to me is too fast to be genetic. I think it has to be something nutritional. Um, it, it seems to be consistent across regions. Uh, I, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't want to go out and limb, but I, I think it has to be something about the growing season that's modified something in our forages or grain. Um, I, I don't think that we've probably had a, this fast of an increase in high lakes that could contribute that to high lake. Plus, for it to be across the whole marketing order, ev everybody would have to be doing it, right? And I know there's a lot of excitement, a lot of increased use, but I'm not sure that it's that consistent across whole orders to, to contribute there. I'd say it's not hurting, right? Uh, but in, and I think like a lot of things, when we look at milk production, uh, you know, it, it's a small impact of a lot of factors might, might be the real answer. And, in um, usually it's not one thing that carries the day. Hmm. Makes sense. Um, Marcus would like to know how does the incorporation of high oleic soybeans into feed formulations necessitate focus on protein fractionization and amino acids. Can you expand on that? Yeah. So, uh, and this is one place that, that, uh, is a little bit weird. And usually the academics are ones going to crazy high levels and industry. People are saying we'd never, we'd never do that. Right. I've, I think I've been more conservative in how, uh, I think of my feeding rates with these. And I, I have to say, I'm, I'm not a protein amino acid person, but when I started balancing a diet with 15% roasted beans, um, protein fractions are, are being pushed in, in a certain direction there, right? So you have a lot of RUP, um, and depending on how you're balancing RUP and balancing amino acids, you're, you're going to have to change your protein strategy to match that, right? Um, so that's where I, I think you can't do these in isolation. It needs to be part of both your protein strategy and your fat strategy, right? And I think they can work together. Um, it's just that you need to be thinking thinking of both. And to me, the, the RUP and the protein side is more what's limiting inclusion than, than the oleic acid. But that's just sort of how I'm looking at it, not being not being a protein person and and sort of not wanting to get a lot of um, too much protein on on one single fraction. So this is where some people look at it and say, OK, I, my REP is getting up. Maybe I'm going to take down my roasting temperature. So I'm not so high of RUP. Maybe I'm going to some people are saying that's why I'm grinding more. Right. I don't like that approach of additional grinding just because that worries me on the, the room and availability uh, uh, rate side. Uh, some people are saying, I'm going to feed some of these raw. Okay, that's that that's fine. That's going to increase RDP. But when you do this, now your least cost formulation is going against a different protein source, right? Um, so now you have to be saying, is this cost effective relative to soybean meal or or whatever whatever other you know your distillers whatever other protein you're bringing in all right thanks kevin uh should we be worried about the loss of essential polyunsaturated fatty acids yeah that's that's a really interesting question I, and i remember uh many years ago uh, a human nutritionist uh when they were talking about the the uh possibility of using these in human nutrition they were worried because if you look at 18.3 is an essential fatty acid and the number one source of 18.3 in the human diet is soybean oil in salad dressing, right? So I have heard mention of concerns on the human side of, um, of limiting 18.3, right? On the cow side, the cow doesn't have much 18.2 or 18.3 being absorbed to begin with. You know, what we have in that conventional soybean is probably 90% biohydrogenated. Um, so, so we're talking about small numbers, but she doesn't have much, much to, to begin with. So if there, if there is a downside, it would be that you are slightly decreasing 
the amount of 18.2 and 18.3. Now, um, if that's enough of a decrease, she's still getting quite a bit of 18.3 from forages, right? Um, that that's the most of the 18.3 in our diets would be coming in from from forages. So, so I guess I right now I'm not uh, worried about that, but that would be one thing to have on your radar. Kevin, I just looked and we're well past the top of the hour. This has uh, been a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I'm going to ask just one last question. This one comes in from Marcus. Uh, would high oleic corn have a bigger impact given that it's homegrown and fed on most dairies? Yeah, so we did characterize fatty acid profile in corn a couple years ago. And um, the conventional corns that are out there are all pretty consistent. I've dug into the literature on, on high oleic corn. Um, there are some varieties that are high oleic, uh, but they are really uh, old varieties and, and not, nothing, you know, orders of magnitude lower in yield. Uh, think, think of um, Indian corn type, type things relative to our, our conventional corn. Um, high oleic corn would be a great option. I had uh, tried to get corn genetics companies interested in that, but they all told me that corn silage is too small of a market. Um, so a, our, our uh, corn genetics companies are very focused on herbicide traits, agronomic traits. There is almost zero interest in um, nutritional traits and high oleic would be would be one of those right but really high oleic is not even a nutritional trait so much as a industrial manufacturing type type trait all right thank you kevin um uh, really interesting uh, webinar is evidenced by the fact that most of our audience is still uh, hung on well past the hour so i want to thank you and i want to thank everybody for attending today's webinar if you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Our Real Science Lecture Series continues with educational topics each month, including on May 7th, when Dr. Trevor DeVries joins us to share lessons learned in research on nutritional management of robot milked cows. And then on June 4th, Dr. Todd Calloway will present, Are Probiotics Just Magic Foo-Foo Dust? Visit balchem.com slash real science for details on future webinars and to register for upcoming events. Balchem's podcast series, The Real Science Exchange, continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. Log on to your favorite podcast platform and search for Real Science Exchange or just go to uh, balchem.com slash podcast. If you want a really uh, cool Real Science Exchange t-shirt, just subscribe to The Real Science Exchange. Send us a screenshot along with your uh, shirt size. At, um, and your address to anh.marketing at balchem.com. We'll get that off to you right away. On behalf of Balchem and Dr. Harvatine, thank you for joining us today.